Good morning. I'm Diana Fuller, and I serve with the Reengage on Wednesday nights, and I serve at the Welcome Desk. Today's scripture is from Exodus 20:14. You shall not commit adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Diana. We are continuing our series through the Ten Commandments. A lot of people would say, why would you bother? Like, what's the importance of the Ten Commandments? Uh, We're a New Testament people, a New Covenant people. Why would we bother and go back and look at the Ten Commandments? Um, A couple of reasons. The first is that all of Scripture, it is God-breathed, right? It is used for us for teaching, for rebuking, for training in righteousness. And so it's beneficial to us. Uh, The second thing is the Ten Commandments are a little bit unique. If you've read much of the Old Testament, you know that there's a lot of laws, especially if you read the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, there's a lot of laws. They govern uh, what we eat, uh, how we conduct ourselves, what we wear, like all sorts of things. But what the Ten Commandments are, they're kind of the central moral teaching of the Old Testament. And so it's something that we should pay attention to. If you remember, uh, God leads the Israelite people out of Egypt. They were slaves there, leads them into the wilderness. They find themselves now uh, approaching Mount Sinai, and God calls Moses up to the mountain, and God comes down to meet with him. In the Ten Commandments, God speaks with Moses. And so we take what is said here very seriously. He begins by reminding them that he is the Lord. I am the Lord. And um, he's making a declaration there of his supremacy and his sovereignty over all of creation, over all that we know and see. He spoke it into existence. He's the God who controls everything happening everywhere all at the same time, and it doesn't even make him tired. He says, I am the Lord. But then he says, I am the Lord, your God. I'm the Lord who heard the the groaning and the crying of the Israelites while they were in slavery. I heard them, and I saw them, and I knew them, and God had delivered them out of their slavery in Egypt. And so we approach the Ten Commandments um, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, right? We don't look to them to save us. It's not if you keep the commandments, you're in. If you break the commandments, you're out. But we look to them knowing this is God's teaching for us in terms of the moral commands. And it's ultimately going to keep us from kind of going off in the ditches that lead to destruction in our life. Now, last week I went back to Genesis and teaching on why we should not murder. And basically what we said there is that every single man and woman has been made in the image of God. Our worth doesn't come from external things, what we can produce, you know, how hip we are, what sorts of talents that we have, but our worth comes from our Creator having been made in His image. And as such, every life is precious before God and His people. Every life should be precious to us. Now this week, we're going to go back to Genesis again. And we're going to look at what God meant when he said, do not commit adultery. Now, just as a quick recap, um, when you read uh, Genesis chapter 1, it's the account of God creating the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light, and there, were, there was light. And so all throughout Genesis chapter 1, it's the, the first six days of creation. When you jump into chapter 2, it's the seventh day of creation where God rested. Now, after describing the seventh day of creation, God actually goes back, um, we see in Genesis chapter 2, and he describes more fully what God did on the sixth day when he created man. And so um, God took Adam, he fashioned him out of dust, he breathed life into his nostrils, and then God began to survey his creation. And he said, there is not a helper suitable for the man. And so in Genesis chapter 2, 18, we're going to pick up, And see what God had to say here. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. It's not good for Adam to be by himself. I'm going to create someone suitable for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. And so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now I bring that up to you to 
to begin to teach you God's design in creation, both for marriage and for our sexuality. Um, again, he, God had surveyed everything else he'd made. There's nothing suitable for man. And so he set out to make someone who was complementary for him. Now, that's not like giving him a compliment, right? But rather complementary in that uh, you could get a sense of completion. Not that your spouse completes you. The Holy Spirit's in the middle of this. But someone who would be suitable for Adam, a compliment to him. Now, just to be clear again, um, God made Eve distinct. He didn't make another Adam. She was uh, distinct uh, physically. She was different such that they would fit together, right? They're going to come together in this one flesh union. She was a woman. She was distinct. She was distinct emotionally. She was distinct in many ways and yet was a compliment to Adam. And so God ordains marriage here that man would leave his mother and father and would come together and be joined together with his wife. In this union, this one flesh union of covenant marriage. And that was God's design. And it was of that one man and one woman who came together in the one flesh relationship in marriage that God gave them the command to go and be fruitful and multiply. And I bring this up because it's important uh, that we understand God's created design, both for marriage and for our sexuality. Uh, I wouldn't ever wish to be too hard on anybody, but God didn't make two Adams because they couldn't have fulfilled his command to go be fruitful and multiply, right? There were not two Eves for that reason. And God here doesn't teach uh, polyamory or polygamy. It was one man, one woman coming together in the one flesh relationship for life. That was his created design in the covenant of marriage. So for our marriage and for our sexuality, uh, I, would, I would want to put it this way. Sex is like a fire, right? Your sexuality is like a fire. And fire inside of a fireplace, it's a gift, isn't it? If you have a fireplace in your house, man, it heats the house up and keeps things warm. It provides ambiance for us in our homes, right? If you have a fire in the fireplace and it's cold outside, a fire is a joy. But when you take the fire out of the fireplace and you put it in the middle of your living room, it will burn your house down. It will cause pain and destruction and suffering. And the same is true for us with our sexuality. God has designed that you should enjoy your sexuality within the confines of the one man, one woman, one flesh covenant of marriage together. That's where it will be joyful, right? It will provide warmth and abundance for you. But outside of the confines of marriage, it's destructive. It causes pain every single time. Y'all, I sit with my kids and they watch YouTube shorts because to actually watch a YouTube video would be too long. So shorts are like 30 second clips, you know, and so you just scroll one to the next and, and over and over and over as I'm sitting there with them, watching them my, myself, I have to scroll past something in which our world is saying, hey, there's another design for your sexuality that's going to be more fulfilling. You need to pursue what you want. Look at this. Here's polyamory. Here's homosexuality. Here's, here, hey, why don't you just kind of do you, whatever that might look like, and that's what's going to make you feel full. Church, I would want to remind you that the God of the universe who spoke all that we know and see into existence, who created us and created our sexuality, has said, hey, it's within these confines that you're going to find joy and fullness. As a matter of fact, you will never have more enjoyable, more fulfilling, more abundant sex than you will within the confines of that one man, one woman, one flesh relationship called marriage. This is God's design. Now that leads us then to what God said in Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 18. You shall not commit adultery. He's given us the design first, and then he's warning us not to take our sexuality outside of the covenant of marriage. So what is adultery? Because this is kind of important, right? In the, in the Hebrew, uh, the, the word is nawaf, and it, it basically means um, to have an affair with someone who's not your spouse or to take your sexuality outside of that covenant, the one man, one woman, one flesh relationship, to take it somewhere else, it's adultery. I remind you, um, it's always destructive. God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than ours. And even where you might be tempted to think and tempted to believe that you know better that something's rather enjoyable, that if I could just express it in this way, if I could just have this desire of my heart, then I would be full. 
God says, do not commit adultery. And don't give in to this. It's destructive, not just to you, but it's destructive to all the people around. When we sin sexually, we sin against ourselves, we sin against our spouse, and we sin against God. So what constitutes adultery? Um, if, you're, if you're overly looking for the rules, you might be in trouble. If you're like, how close can I get to the line? You might be in trouble. But if you're seeking to honor God and say, okay, what is adultery? How do I know that I'm not going to be committing that thing? Uh, the first way uh, that we, the first thing that constitutes adultery, number one here, is having an affair with someone who isn't your spouse. You've made a covenant with your spouse, and to break that covenant, to go outside um, and have an affair, that would constitute adultery. In Malachi, Malachi chapter 2 verses 13 through 15 says, and this second, this is God speaking through his prophet to the nation of Israel, by the way. These were God's chosen people. He said, this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Why wouldn't God accept our offerings? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in the Spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. To stray outside of the covenant of marriage um, and expressing our sexuality there, it's adultery. You're straying from God's design. It's always going to be painful. You see, the thing about our God is he is a covenant-keeping God. You know the difference between a contract and a covenant, right? A contract says if you uh, do A, then I will do B. If you give me the car, I'm going to give you the money for the car. And much of our world understands um, uh, relationships in terms of contract. If she will take care of me, if she cooks well, you know, she does all the things I think a wife should do, then I'm going to be a husband to do her. I'm going to provide. I want to be everything a husband should be. And then when you think contractually, if she doesn't do this, then I'm not going to do these things. But that's not how covenant works at all. If you remember our relationship with God, the only thing we brought to the table was our sin, right? And God said, I love him and I love her and I want him and I want her. And Jesus went to the cross and died for people who had nothing to give him in return. Covenant is just I do. It's not based upon the other person's, you know, uh, contributions or how they act or conduct themselves. It's just I do. And as the people of God, we are supposed to reflect God's faithfulness to his covenants in our faithfulness to our covenants to one another. So having an affair on your spouse, that's adultery. That's sinning against yourself and against your spouse and against God. The second thing that would constitute adultery, um, that may constitute adultery, is divorcing your spouse and marrying another now, you, you, you might look around and think, oh my goodness, this, this happens a lot in our, in our world. And I would say, absolutely it does. I don't think the church has done a great job of displaying the covenant faithfulness of God to a world who's watching. Matter of fact, we tend to divorce at rates that are uh, at least close to similar uh, to those of unbelievers. So here's what the scriptures say. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees have come to him, and they, they basically ask him the question, can we divorce our, our, our wives for any reason? That was one of the teachings uh, of their day. Can we divorce our, our wives for any reason? In verse 4, he answered him. He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? They're distinct, but both made in the image of God, right? He made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So I want to give you a blanket statement here. Um, to, mar- uh, to divorce your spouse and to marry another um, for any reason other than adultery, and the second would be abandonment by, abandonment by an unbeliever. I'll get into it in a minute. To do so outside of those two reasons is to commit adultery. And it may feel a little bit harsh, 
It may seem a little bit strange in the midst of our culture where uh, divorce and remarriage happens all the time. You might have grown up in a home under those, uh, those circumstances, um, but this is God's design. And as a young person, I would say, um, be very, very careful when you are seeking a spouse. Um, don't go into it uh, where you think you're just overwhelmed by love. You're, you know, and when you think of him, your heart flutters. You think, this is the one. You need to ask yourself, am I ready to be a husband to this woman if she, has, if she can give me nothing back in return? Am I ready to love her till death do us part? If she doesn't uh, stay as beautiful as she is or she isn't as nice or whatever it might be in the same way for you, ladies. Am I ready to give my life to them, even if they have nothing to give back in return? This is the covenant faithfulness that God has called us to in the midst of our marriages. So the, the two exclusions here. Um, he says, if you um, divorce and remarry, except for reason of uh, immorality, the Greek word here is porneia. You may recognize this is where we get our modern day word for pornography. What did he mean when Jesus said, except for reason of immorality? Well, uh, that word's going to give us a picture of adultery. We've already heard that. Of fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, um, intercourse with animals. Anytime you're taking your sexuality outside of this one man, one woman, one flesh relationship in the covenant of marriage, um, you're committing immorality. This is sexual immorality before God. And so, Jesus says, um, if you divorce for any reason, so if your spouse has been unfaithful to you, sexually unfaithful, um, the Scriptures permit you to divorce. But I want to say permit and not prescribe. They allow it. God allows this. He doesn't encourage it. What we should seek, even when there's been sin against us, even when there's been adultery, what we should seek is to be reconciled to our spouse, to show them the same kind of love and grace and forgiveness that God has shown to us, even when we were unfaithful to him. Okay? So again, God allows for divorce in this case, but he doesn't uh, recommend it. All right? The second uh, way that we can have a divorce and not commit adultery is in the case of abandonment by an unbeliever. If you, you think about this, when the gospel began to be spread around the known world at the time, uh, a husband would come to faith and his wife wouldn't, or a wife would come to faith and her husband uh, wouldn't have. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the apostle Paul says, um, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she shouldn't divorce him. Then in verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So these are two cases in which um, if you are divorced, you are free to remarry, and it is not adultery. All other cases are adulterous. Now, I want to say something. There are cases of abuse and extreme difficulty that uh, sometimes we have to walk through. And I, I want you to know that our elders uh, would be more than happy to walk with you through some of these difficult situations. This is not always cut and dried. And so if you're having difficulty in your marriage, if there's abuse or neglect, uh, we would love to, to walk with you through that season and help you in any way that we can. Okay? So what constitutes adultery? Certainly having an affair on your spouse. Maybe if you are divorcing and remarrying. And then the third way is the one that kind of equalizes everything for us. Because if it wasn't for this, we might have a tendency in the church to look at someone who'd had an affair and think, I can't believe what she just did. Like, how could a guy do that to his spouse? Like, what kind of person is he, right? We might have a ten tendency to be self-righteous and judgmental toward other people, except Jesus didn't leave adultery just in the realm of what we do with our physical bodies. Here's what he said in Matthew chapter 5. He said, you've, you've heard that it was said, you, you remember the Ten Commandments? You've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And what Jesus is telling us is that adultery isn't just an affair that we do with our bodies. Adultery is something that can happen even in our minds when we look at someone with lustful intent. When we crave what somebody else has, something other than what God has given to us. We've committed adultery. And so we don't get to look at someone who's done it physically with their body and think, how could she do that? Because we've done that. Your pastor has done that. Every man and woman in this room has dealt with lust and adulterous thoughts at some point. See, the sin of adultery... It happens in our hearts 
and not just with our hands. And as we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, well, what shouldn't happen is that we're, you know, working really hard to restrain ourselves from doing outwardly that we long to do inwardly. That would be evidence that we need Jesus to transform our hearts. And I wouldn't be a very good pastor to you if I didn't address the issue that has visited every home, probably in this entire church, that is epidemic in our society, and that's the issue of pornography. There's a survey in 2018, it was a Canadian survey, surveyed 1,036 individuals, 50% men, 50% women, and these were ages 18 to 55, when you probably ought to have your stuff together, right? You're 55 years old, you should be able to handle some things at this point in your life. Um, Every one of these couples was already in a relationship, I asked them about their pornography usage. A study found that 98% of men reported using pornography in the last six months. It was also true of 73% of the women. So maybe to put that in perspective, if there were 100 people in this room, and we're to go you know, person to person, and everyone was completely honest, hey, have you viewed pornography in the last six months? There would be two men in the room who could say no. And similarly, if there were 100 women in this room, there would be 27 out of 100 that could say no. God cares about our covenant faithfulness, and sexual sin is always destructive. Just a note to you parents, this is everywhere around your child. Um, I got to be in a men's event this past weekend, and these big old strong men, they came up to me afterward, and they were hugging me, and they were weeping, and they were talking to me about uh, a few of them about how they've been sinned against sexually with kids and how that has absolutely brought them extraordinary pain in their lives. And as men, to try to learn how to handle your sexual life, let's just say this, sex is for adults, right? It's for grown-ups. It's not for kids. And yet what happens over and over and over, and we've got to be careful this as parents, is we give them a device, we give them a phone with unlimited access to pornography, and you take sexuality from a, a, you know, an adult who can handle it, and you place it in the hand of a kid, and Satan wreaks havoc. I just encourage you as parents, and check up on your kids' devices. Don't give them a device if they're not ready for it. Filter as best as you can filter. Like, be on top of this, because Satan wants to use this to wreak havoc in your child's life. To see these big, strong, grown men weeping, because of things that happened in their childhood, that here they are, grown men, and they still can't control. We've got to be careful as a church, careful about what we allow into our homes, careful about what we allow our kids to be exposed to. But it's not just our kids, is it? Wives, statistics tell us this is true of your husband too. He's wrestling with this. Even if he's a godly man and he wants to be faithful, he's wrestling with pornography. And husbands, statistics say it's probably true of your wife as well. So in marriage, we've got to turn and fight for each other. We've got to help each other have proper boundaries. We've got to help each other win this battle, praying for each other, fighting for one another. So here we are. You just, you know, did the full-length trial for all of us. You would find that all of us in this room are guilty. We've all sinned against God. We've all committed adultery. So where do we go from here? If I was going to give you a commercial for our church, I probably wouldn't, you know, advertise that, uh, hey, uh, welcome to this church. This is a place where we've all committed adultery. And if you were here last week, uh, a church full of murderers, whether we've done it with our hands or in our hearts, we've, we've murdered and we've committed adultery. It probably wouldn't be a very good commercial. Um, but if you're here today and you find that you too have committed adultery, or you're carrying around bitterness and anger, what God would call murderous thoughts in your heart, I want you to know that you're in the right place. Because while it may be true that we've all committed adultery, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, our story doesn't end with our sin. Our story doesn't end with what we've done. We're not defined by our past. We're not defined by our our mistakes. Our story ends with redemption in Christ Jesus. 
Our story ends in victory in him. Here's what we found. We're like As believers, we're not better than the rest of the world, right? We sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. What we have, the reason that we celebrate and the reason that we worship is we have found redemption and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. We don't look down on other people because they sin. Like We don't turn our noses up like we're better. We know that we're not. But we have found forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ. What we know is that God saw us in our worst moment, in our deepest of sins, the moments that we're most ashamed of, God looked down on us. And in that moment, knowing full well what we did, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were in the midst of that sin, Jesus Christ died for us. In the midst of your worst day, your, your moment you're most ashamed of, Jesus looked at you and he said, I want her. I want him. And he went to the cross and he suffered and he bled and he died. And he did so that we didn't have to stay enslaved to that sin anymore, that we didn't have to be defined by our adultery or by our murder or by any other sin. But we could be defined by the righteous life that Jesus Christ lived. What happened there on the cross for those of us who place our faith and trust in Jesus is known as the great exchange where Jesus took our sin and our guilt and our shame. God placed those on Jesus and he bore them, right? God poured out the just punishment for sin. Jesus cries out on the cross, it is finished. He endured the punishment that you and I deserved. And God took that perfect righteous life of Jesus and he credited that to us that we might now have a relationship with God, that we might know him, we might live in freedom from our sin and our guilt and our shame as new people, new creations in Christ Jesus. But unfortunately, a lot of people deal with their sin the way that our society dealt with the pandemic. Isolated themselves. Going to public, you put on a mask, you come to church. No one has to know how sick you really are. A few years ago, uh, I went to Haiti with a group of guys, and if you've ever been to Haiti, uh, you won't forget it. There is this smell everywhere you go from the moment you step off the plane till the moment you, lo- you load back up. It's really a, a couple of things. It smells like um, urine and burnt plastic. And it gets on you. And I mean, it's in your clothes. It was in my suitcase. There's a backpack. My wife still won't let me bring the house. It's like, it just smells. And I remember we'd been there that week and man, it was hot and you sleep outdoors and it it was a really difficult trip. And uh, we got back on the plane to go home and I think it was in Miami. We get back in, you know, the the plane and everyone else on, on the plane from Haiti, they'd been in Haiti. They all smelled the same. But when we got on the plane in Miami, I remember knowing I smelled terribly knowing that it must have been offensive to be around me. And so uh, very naturally, I'm trying to stray away from other passengers. I'm like looking for the empty, you know, row on the plane, anything I can do. And everywhere I went, I was just conscious that I've got this smell, I've got this stench, and, and I hate this. And then I went home and took a long, hot shower. It was the first hot shower I'd had in a week And I went to Walmart with my wife, and I wasn't worried anymore about what people thought of me because I had been cleansed. Here's what Jesus tells us for those of us who find ourselves in the midst of sins. This is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus cleanses us. He takes that sin from us such that we don't have to isolate ourselves anymore. We don't have to wear a mask and pretend like everything's okay. And we can be cleansed. We can be pure. We can have that righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to our hearts and to our lives. And we don't go out in front of people talking about how good we were. But we go out into the world and we talk about how good Jesus Christ has been to us. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've never experienced the the love and the grace and the mercy, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for your sin, I want you to know that Jesus died for you too. And that Jesus Christ is pursuing your heart. He wants to set you free from your sin and he wants to give you the fullest, richest, most abundant life that you could ever possibly live. And it's a life lived in submission to him. Here in a couple of minutes, I'm going to be right down here. If you don't know Jesus Christ and he's drawing your heart today, I would love to visit with you about what it means to follow after him. If you're here today, you're a believer who's fallen into sin again. Sometimes that's more shameful than being an unbeliever, right? 
because you should have had it right this time, and you find yourself again enslaved to sin, James chapter 5, 16 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. I would love to meet with you down here and pray for you. There are people in your row, people all around you would love to pray for you as you confess your sins. The beauty of it is, is that Jesus died, that we're forgiven of our sins. And we come to him by faith, not by our works. We don't earn it. We don't, you know, ingratiate ourselves to God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But all of us are justified freely by his grace. And so, if you're sick here today, you know, isolate yourself and hide. Call for a doctor. Cry out to Jesus. Ask him to save you. Ask him to rescue you from your sin. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are a good God who saves men like me who had every chance to get it right. But God, I still sin against you. God, I'm a murderer and I'm an adulterer. God, I've broken your commands and I don't deserve your mercy or your grace. God, still, you freely gave it. For every man and woman in this room who might feel like they don't deserve it, God, I pray that you would show them just how much you love them, how you have lavished those things freely on us. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. For the believer who's here, who's caught up in sin, I pray that today would be the day of confession. They could gather with men and women who love you and who will pray for them that they might find healing. God, may we as your people not walk in slavery to sin anymore, but victory instead. So, Lord, we just pray that you would have your way in our midst. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand.